So the topic for the day is parathyroid carcinoma. And what I intend to do is uh, talk a little bit about, because we have about 45 minutes for presentation and some time for discussion, I will have to restrict uh, to a broad overview of parathyroid carcinoma. I would try to cover some bit of all aspects of parathyroid carcinoma, its etiopathogenesis, the presentation, um, diagnosis, surgical and non-surgical treatment, and then outcomes. Uh, a bit about Indian data as well. So, um, okay, why does it not? Okay, now I can move it. Yes, so <clears throat> I'm sure all of us um, being a little bit initiated into endocrine surgery and hyperparathyroidism are quite well aware that parathyroid carcinoma are the rarest of all endocrine malignancies. And, and if you have to define it, it is a rare epithelial malignancy of the parathyroid glands, which is a very uncommon cause for hyperparathyroidism. Uh, less than 10%, in fact, much lesser than 10% of all parathyroid carcinomas are non-functional not resulting in hyperparathyroidism. And the hallmark of parathyroid carcinoma is severe clinical and biochemical hyperparathyroidism. Uh, there are classic clinical, biochemical, gross and histologic features uh, of parathyroid carcinoma which help us diagnose it. But unfortunately, in a large proportion of patients, uh, they may lack any of these classical features, making it difficult to diagnose them. Surgery is the only worthwhile treatment and there is really no effective adjuvant treatment. So radical surgery first time and whenever required for reoperation is the only answer. There are possible other ways of treating like uh, calcium emetics and control. These are all essentially meant to control hypercalcemia in patients with uncontrolled parathyroid carcinoma. But recurrences and metastasis are common. Outcomes depend on adequacy of initial surgical treatment. In spite of well-performed surgery, there are patients who are bound to come back with recurrences. So uh, if you look at the history, uh, the first description of parathyroid carcinoma came as a non-functional carcinoma in 1904 by Fritz Duquerman. In 1933, we find a description of functional parathyroid carcinoma. Uh, so it is the least common endocrine malignancies and the prevalence is 0.005% of all cancers. Majority of parathyroid carcinoma is sporadic, less than 5% being familial. The overall incidence is quite low, but in recent decades, the incidence seems to be increasing. And there's at least one study which has uh, documented that the incidence increased by about 60% between two times time periods. In the duration of 1988 to 91, uh, the incidence was 3.58 per 10 million population. And in the time period of 2000 to 2003, it rose to 5.73 per 10 million population as per the US National Cancer Database. Uh, as a cause of hyperparathyroidism, it accounts, the parathyroid carcinoma accounts for less than 3% of all PP, PHPT patients. In fact, in majority of Western series, it is less than 1%. The incidence seems to be somewhat higher in Japanese and Italian series. And we are well aware the incidence, the relative incidence is much, much higher in Indian and other developing country series. In our own experience, the, the relative incidence has remained at around 4%. And in most recent uh, uh, review of this, we find it is 3.9% of 429 PHPT patients. Uh, similar figures have been quoted from other series in India. Uh, what causes parathyroid carcinoma is perhaps not fully understood. It has been reported in long-standing renal hyperparathyroidism in patients who have received head and neck irradiation. But the only worthwhile molecular basis that we know of or only foolproof basis is the cell development cycle 73 gene or which was called 
the HRPT2 gene in, in the earlier years, uh, located on chromosome one, uh, which is a tumor suppressor gene. It encodes a 5N31 amino acid nuclear protein called the parafibromin. And the parafibromin protein is a paraphrase for parathyroid disease and fibroaceous lesions. Uh, this gene, when mutated, when we, we know that germline mutations of this gene are responsible for causation of jaw tumor para, uh, hyperparathyroidism syndrome. Roughly a third of these patients who have HPTJT syndrome have parathyroid carcinoma. Though germline mutations are the ones which we initially or people were initially interested in, but in almost two thirds of all sporadic parathyroid carcinoma, somatic mutations of CDC73 or HRPT genes are known. We also know that these parathyroid carcinomas at only occasionally or rarely can be seen or have been reported in MEN type 1 as well as MEN type 2A. But these are only anecdotal, very rare instances. So somatic mutations of CDC73 or HRPT, as I said earlier, have been reported in various series between 60 to 100 percent of all patients with parathyroid carcinoma and germline mutations are less common if we consider all the parathyroid carcinoma as such. If we specifically look at HPTJT syndrome, as I said, it is much commoner and there are some patients with uh, familial isolated hyperparathyroidism where we know they have a germline mutation there's a whole uh, kindred, a very large family of FIHPT reported from, uh, 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 from Italy, which has a CDC73 HRPT2 mutation. Besides the uh, CDC73 mutations, uh, loss of heterozygosity in the long arm of chromosome 13, uh, that has been reported. And this is the locus where the tumor suppressor genes, the retinoblastoma gene or RB1, as well as BRCA2 are located. Similarly, there have been anecdotal reports of loss of heterozygosity in P10, HRAS, MET, and TP53. Uh, coming to the natural history, patients are often diagnosed quite late. Uh, when left untreated, these patients have usually have a single parathyroid tumor. The clinical course is not predictable. In most cases, the course is indolent. Uh, recurrences are known to happen even quite late after surgery for hyperparathyroidism. At initial surgery, especially in earlier years, uh, parathyroid carcinoma used to be missed. The diagnosis used to be missed and recurrences have been found even after many decades of initial surgery. The tumors are typically found as hard, locally invasive cancers. Uh, at times they may present with, very rarely they may present with initial metastatic disease and with, in which case these are metastases to lungs, the liver, bones. Median survival after first recurrence in some series at least, not so recent ones, has been shown to be quite short. And usually, death is due to effects of uncontrolled and refractory hypercalcemia rather than local invasive, invasive tumor itself. So most often, uh, the diagnosis of parathyroid carcinoma is missed. It is, mis uh, mis um, uh, it is uh, misinterpreted as a benign hyperparathyroidism, but there are certain features which raise the suspicion of parathyroid carcinoma. And these are the ones which I would like to highlight. Usually patients are young, mostly in the fifth decade. And this is about a decade younger compared to benign hyperparathyroidism patients. If we take into consideration the global scenario, global data. In India, as such, we see our hyperparathyroidism patients are younger compared to the West. But even in our own, and, and in that way, parathyroid carcinoma patients are no different in their age at presentation in our own series. Uh, in, in our experience, the mean age has been 37 years. It is rarely seen in children. And usually the male to female ratio is almost equal. But in our experience, much larger proportion of females have been managed with parathyroid carcinoma. 
So uh, the clinical presentation of the disease is just like any symptomatic parathyroid, hyperparathyroidism patient that we commonly know or have managed in India. Uh, when it, however, in experience of uh, Western surgeons or Western physicians, this seems to be a, a quite a starkly different clinical presentation because for them, uh, the majority of patients are diagnosed with asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic primary hyperparathyroidism. The common presentations are with bone disease, uh, with bone fractures, uh, renal stones, or both of them together, fatigue, muscular weakness, uh, nausea and vomiting, polydipsia, polyuria, which are symptoms of hypercalcemia, and in few cases, uh, weight loss, anorexia. Again, mostly due to hypercalcemia itself and not because of uh, uh, metastatic disease. For us, we know that we have, as we have described, this entity of extreme hyperparathyroidism resulting in parathyroid cripple, where patients are crippled because of a combination of advanced skeletal disease, musculoskeletal disease, and vitamin D deficiency. And I'm sure some of you would have seen these uh, descriptions in our publications uh, over the last two decades. These are, again, not sign you know for parathyroid carcinoma for us in India. However, if these kind of presentations are seen in the rest of the world, in the Western world for sure, they would be seen as indicators of parathyroid carcinoma. So uh, looking at the global picture, patients usually would present with skeletal manifestations and they've been described in about 40 to 70% patients, renal manifestations in 30 to 60 percent of patients and quite a bit almost a third of all are reported to have concomitant skeletal and renal manifestation in our own experience 50 percent half of all patients with parathyroid carcinoma have concomitant uh, skeletal and renal manifestations palpable neck mass is often considered as a very strong indicator of the tumor being malignant uh, when you are able to palpate a parathyroid tumor. But then this, as we have all known in Indian patients, it's not so uncommon to find a palpable tumor. And in our ex published experience, 50% uh, of all parathyroid carcinomas were palpable, but then 27% or one quarter of all adenomas were also palpable. So again, you cannot be certain about uh, the, the tumor being parathyroid carcinoma if you were looking just from the view of palpability of, of a parathyroid tumor. Uh, there is a certain number of non-functional parathyroid carcinomas reported. We have had just one case in our own experience where the patient did not have uh, neither hypercalcemia nor hyperparathyroidism and the, the diagnosis of parathyroid carcinoma was established when we excised a palpable neck mass, which we initially thought was a thyroid nodule. Uh, so these non-functioning cases, though few, they present really late and the outcomes are not as great or, or even worse as compared to the functional parathyroid carcinoma. Uh, and it makes no, I mean, it's not surprising that in a patient with classic PHPT who presents with recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy without any history of prior neck surgery, one must consider this to be malignant, locally invasive, unless proven otherwise. As I said earlier, very few, almost 1% of all parathyroid carcinomas present with metastatic disease, metastasis outside of the neck. Uh, lymph node involvement is not very common, but in, in various series, it has been reported in up to 30% of cases. When distant metastasis are seen, mostly as metachronous metastasis, they affect lungs commonly but uncommonly bones, liver, kidney, adrenal pancreas, brain, all kinds of metastatic disease have been reported. And this is one of our own patients uh, managed in 1998, between 1999 and 2002 or so. This lady, soon after, almost six months after the initial treatment for parathyroid carcinoma, presented back with seizures and we found she had multiple brain metastases in fact, she succumbed very soon after that. So in terms of how do we establish the diagnosis, you would establish the diagnosis as you would do for any PHPT patient. 
by doing biochemical estimation, serum calcium, phosphorus, and PTH, vitamin D. Uh, these patients often or almost always have very high serum calcium levels, usually more than 14 milligram per deciliter. And PTH levels are also extremely high, definitely more than two times up per normal. And these patients, because they have skeletal disease, have high alkaline phosphatase. Uh, you can suspect this can, these patients because the skeletal radiology would show classical features of osteitis fibrosa cystica. These patients would have gross osteoporosis on BMD. And once you have established the biochemical diagnosis, you try and localize the parathyroid tumor uh, using a combination of a functional system EV scan and an anatomical high resolution ultrasound. Uh, but you can also use contrast enhanced CT. And in patients with recurrent or elusive parathyroid tumor, you can even use 4D CT. FDG PET has been shown to be useful. In, in knowing the extent of disease in patients where you are able to suspect the disease or the malignancy preoperatively, because it would tell you about whether or not an aggressive surgical treatment or aggressive prognostic importance. And these kind of skeletal pictures, I'm sure all of us are quite well aware. Uh, patients with osteitis fibrosa cystica showing subperiosteal bone resorption, salt and pepper skull, absent lamina dura in, 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 this, in the teeth, and uh, diffuse spinal osteopenia. I'm sure we have had a number of discussions on these in this fraternity of endocrine surgeons, and so I'm not really going too much into details. Uh, one specific aspect of skeletal radiology I would like to remind my younger colleagues because. Uh, some of us who have trained and who have worked in the 1990s and perhaps earlier part of 2000, the decade 2000 to 2010, we have seen many such patients. But now, fortunately, such patients with disappearing bones or syndrome of extreme or uh, a syndrome of parathyroid cripple or syndrome of disappearing bone have now disappeared altogether, almost altogether. And, and you can see this is a set of radiographs published by uh, us in, in one of the previous publications. Uh, the bones are almost invisible. But interestingly, after parathyroidomy, the brown tumors, they kind of fill in with calcium and minerals and show up on, on, on radiographs. And then in follow-up, they gradually, they lighten up. So these are interesting um, skeletal radio, radiology which uh, are very uh, few in, 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 in very few cases have been reported. Patients may have bilateral, multiple, staghorn, other kind of calculi. And this is an interesting radiograph because besides bilateral renal calculi, you can see another very interesting thing, which is, uh, unfortunately, this, is, this platform is not very interactive, but would have been good to know from any of these students. But this is a chain of lakes. Chain of lakes sign, uh, I'm sure all students of general surgery know what it is. I'll leave it for the end to discuss another view of the same patient. So you can see that the calculi are seen in two planes. This is the, kid, the, the plane of kidney, kidneys and the ureters. And there's another set of calculi, which time permitting, we can discuss later on. This patient at extreme osteoporosis. A lady who had a suspected parathyroid carcinoma turned out to be atypical adenoma, but this is not uncommon to pay, find patients with extreme osteoporosis. And the same can be seen on various other radiographs, classical features of superiorstal resorption, tufting of terminal phalanges, bone cyst on, and x-rays, and finding a large parathyroid tumor in majority when we do a system EV scan. If the same is true on ultrasound. You would find a large tumor seen on uh, almost like a, a third, per, third thyroid lobe. And if, if it is invading the tissue planes, then you know that you are dealing with a parathyroid carcinoma. And this is a picture of a patient with parathyroid carcinoma. You can see the edges, the, the margins are fuzzy. They are invading into the surrounding soft tissue, and this should raise the suspicion of carcinoma. 
system EB scan is useful it look in helping in localization of of the tumor but it does not offer any differentiation between benign and malignant parathyroid tumors uh, in varying degrees of or, or varying extent uh, to a variable extent mev can be found uh, to be concentrated in not just in the primary tumor but rarely in the functional metastatic disease and this is usually helpful in the follow up of patients but they've been reported of bone cyst and brown tumors which are not really metastatic uh, lesions uh, but which are part of osteitis fibrosa cystica the classical skeletal manifestation of um, primary hyperparathyroidism and those two have been known to concentrate cyst in ev but in context of parathyroid carcinoma specifically 18f fdg pet and at times carbon 11 methionine in pet are useful in both initial localization and in follow up there is no role for fnac usually it would not be advocated not just because it is not very useful in distinguishing benign and malignant tumors but also it carries a risk of needle tract implantation as we have reported earlier uh fna of uh, a fine needle aspirate for cytology and pth estimation can be used in in dif- in, in characterizing a possible metastasis or in the reoperative setting in benign hyperparathyroidism ph fnac can lead to alterations in the histopathology which may mimic carcinoma later on and that is another reason why we do usually do not advocate uh, a parathyroid tumor to be aspirated we do not put in a needle into a parathyroid carcinoma whether it is benign or malignant uh, we reported in uh, way back in 2006 or so yes 2006 a patient with parathyroid carcinoma who was initially treated in 1996 had a and then came back with a recurrent skin nodule this skin nodule was quite perplexing the patient was totally asymptomatic the biochemical picture was normal she didn't have hypercalcemia but when we evaluated this skin nodule we found it had uh, parathyroid carcinoma deposits and then on reviewing this uh, chain of events we found this recurrence was along the needle track of fnac from this palpable neck mass initially and we we reported in langenbeck's archives of surgery so looking at all this clinical biochemical imaging picture when do you suspect parathyroid carcinoma in a patient who is hyper- presenting with primary hyperparathyroidism usually you would find a symptomatic patient uh, who is young who has concomitant skeletal and renal disease and usually the patient may have palpable neck mass uh, the patient may or may not have sorry the patient may or may not have uh, how do i go back need to go back yes so the patient may or may not have a uh, palpable neck mass uh, may not may, or may not have any distant metastasis more often not the patient would not have metastatic disease but the patient would have markedly elevated calcium and pth levels so this is when yeah, a very high index of suspicion needs to be entertained because that is the only way you can detect majority of parathyroid carcinoma before operating while it is good to say that these are the features which are sus- which make you suspicious of parathyroid carcinoma but in our own experience unfortunately all these features young age palpable neck mass symptomatic disease concomitant skeletal and renal manifestations extremely high serum calcium and pth levels and large parathyroid tumors uh, which of course also reflect in terms of palpable parathyroid tumors these have been found in in quite a significant proportion of patients with benign parathyroid tumors and hyperparathyroidism and the only ex- difference we we have reported comparing patients with benign parathyroid tumors and uh, 
uh, malignant parathyroid tumors in this publication in 2006, which included 100 consecutive cases of PHPT, was that the tumor weight in patients with carcinoma was significantly higher as compared to patients who had benign disease, parathyroid adenomas. Uh, and, and, and otherwise, all the other features that we talked about earlier, including palpable disease and extreme degree of hypercalcemia, hyperparathyroidism, they were comparable. So I think it is more of a function of whether we are dealing with symptomatic is or asymptomatic uh, uh, and minimally symptomatic PHPT patients that these things may help in differentiating benign versus malignant. But it is always good to have these things in mind if in, in presence of such features to, to consider parathyroid carcinoma because as I said earlier, that's the only way of detecting parathyroid carcinoma preoperatively. So we are now dealing with a cancer and it makes intuitively this cancer must be staged, but it is, it, you may find it interesting that the first TNM AJCC staging for parathyroid carcinoma was proposed as recently as just three years ago. So because of the rarity of this disease and because of lack of clear, uh, lack of, uh, lack of clear prognostic and predictive uh, features, both clinical imaging, biochemical, the TNM AGSCC had so far never uh, uh, proposed a TNM staging. It was only as recently as 2016 when it was proposed and the eighth edition, which was finally published in 2017, that uh, TNM classification has been brought out. Of course, Dr. Shah and Shaha in 1999 in a paper in cancer, they had proposed a staging system which was used until 2016. But the current TNM AJCC staging is where atypical parathyroid tumors are called TIS. T1 is any size of parathyroid carcinoma which is limited to the parathyroid or if it is extending beyond, it is limited to soft tissue. T2 is tumor invading thyroid gland. T3 is tumor invading uh, recurrent nerve, uh, esophagus, and trachea, and T4 in those invading major blood vessels of the spine. Similarly, if there are no lymph nodes, of course, it is N0. If there are central nodes involved, these, this is called TN, N1A, and then lateral neck nodes, N1B, and presence and absence of metastasis as usual. So as it, it would be apparent to you, this staging is almost always possible to arrive at post-operatively and not pre-operatively. So, we have, so far, we have talked about the clinical presentation, the diagnosis, uh, imaging, and staging of parathyroid carcinoma. Now, coming to the treatment. So, in this whole big uh, canvas detailing the parathyroid carcinoma, the only thing worthwhile mentioning is surgery because that's the only proven useful treatment there's no worthwhile adjuvant treatment with proven efficacy. However, because there is, it is so often required, all kinds of experimental therapies have been tried and we'll talk about it. When we talk of parathyroid carcinoma surgery, it is the only effective modality. And what you do is try to do an end block resection of the parathyroid tumor along with any adjacent involved neck structures. These may be the strap muscles, uh, the recurrent laryngeal nerve, the thyroid, even esophageal wall, and then whatever other structures may be involved because that's the only and eff only effective way of controlling the disease or attempting a cure. You may or may not include central compartment lymph node dissection, usually on the side of the tumor, and if required, lateral neck dissection, only in presence of uh, metastatic nodes and you must avoid spillage of tumor cells because that will be catastrophic. Lymph node metastases are not very common and so therefore central compartment node dissection should be done only if there are enlarged or metastatic nodes. There has been no recorded proven benefit of prophylactic central neck dissection or lateral neck dissection and so it must be reserved only in patients where you have some uh, evidence of 
lymph nodal metastasis. And here is one example of a large invasive parathyroid carcinoma. This is the tumor and this is the hemithyroid specimen along with the central compartment, uh, hemicentral compartment dissection because there was one enlarged node. So we did a hemicentral dissection. There was another node which is not represented here because that was sent for frozen section evaluation. So as and when you are facing a patient with in a tumor invading any of the structures surrounding it, you must do an end block resection. There's been some experience or a written a reported data where uh, <coughs> adequacy of surgery has been <coughs> very aptly or very adequately addressed. And this paper in 1999, uh, the authors reported that wherever an end block excision of a parathyroid carcinoma was done, the local recurrence rate was 8%, whereas in those patients which underwent just simple parathyroidectomy, the local recurrence rate was as high as more than 50%. And similarly, it did reflect in overall survival rates in patients who had undergone the initial end block resection, the overall survival rates in, at five years was 89% compared to survival rate of just 53% in patients who had a simple parathyroidectomy and not an end block or um, a, a radical parathyroidectomy. Postoperatively, majority of patients would develop hypo hypocalcemia, and that's again uh, may not be such a rare um, phenomenon in our Indian patients, but it is something of interest, and, and it may be a very startling uh, occurrence in, in in experience of Western surgeons. And symptomatic hypocalcemia needs to be managed, as you, I'm sure, all of you would have managed post parathyroidectomy for benign as well as malignant parathyroid disease. The gross pathology usually is quite a quite a classical one. The, the usual, the classic parathyroid carcinoma is an irregular, usually lobulated or nodular tumor, which is gritty, white, gray, and uh, quite firm on cutting. And this is a, a, a specimen of a rare intrathyroidal parathyroid carcinoma. Once again, we have reported this. Uh, this was a patient where the parathyroid was elusive, and though it was localized on system EB scan. Uh, we could not locate it right away during surgery, but uh, the ultrasound features were, the surgeon performed ultrasound features, did give us a clue that this may be an intrathyroidal parathyroid tumor. And so we did a hemithyroidectomy and on cut surface, we found a nodular gritty parathyroid tumor, which was then finally reported as parathyroid carcinoma. Histopathology of parathyroid carcinoma itself has been quite an interesting story. The first reported set of histological features were reported by Shantz and Castleman, which were modified later on by Bondinson. And then in 2004, we had the first WHO classification. And the features which are indicative of malignancy on histology are capsulin invasion, broad fibrous septae or bands, vascular invasion, frequent mitotic figures, though those are not very classic of malignancy, invasion of surrounding structures and lymph nodal metastasis. Mere cellular pleomorphism or atypia is definitely not indicative of malignancy. Uh, these features on histology they help us diagnose as well as prognosticate uh, in one series, uh, very classically presence of vascular invasion had a very high probability of uh, in predicting poor prognosis and local recurrence. So was invasion of surrounding structures, but presence of fibrous bands was shown to have a protective or, or it, used, it, it was shown to result in much lower in incidence of local recurrence. So these are some of the classical histopathology features, hyperchromatic chief cells, which are either, uh, uh, which are uh, 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 laid down in sheets or trabeculae, capsular invasion, as well as presence of wide, uh, this is a picture showing intravascular tumor thrombus or vascular invasion, and presence of such wide fibrous septi. These must raise the suspicion for parathyroid carcinoma. Parafibromin immunostain is, is again something which we usually do for 
differentiating adenoma, atypical adenoma and carcinoma. And you can see in a patient with car parathyroid carcinoma, the parathyroid immunostaining is almost uh, completely absent. And this is classic of parathyroid carcinoma. Uh, at times, or rather many a times, the diagnosis of parathyroid carcinoma would come only as a, par as a histological surprise. What do you do in that, in that scenario? If the pathology seems an aggressive one with presence of gross capsular invasion, vascular invasion, and the patient has persistent hypercalcemia, hyperparathyroidism, you can plan to reoperate the patient, complete the radical or end block resection, which means ipsilateral hemithyroidectomy with or without central compartment neck dissection, excision of any uh, possibly involved structures. However, if the histological features seem only low grade, not so aggressive, and the calcium and PTH levels are not elevated, one can keep these patients on a close follow-up, which, which would include three monthly serum calcium PTH, ultrasonography, and hold on to the end block resection or repeat surgery as and when a recurrence manifests. Uh, when you have a recurrent parathyroid carcinoma, usually it is in terms of local recurrence or distant recurrence. Multiple reoperations may be required to control the local recurrence or the distant metastasis, as well as for palliation of uh, the hypercalcemia. In fact, surgical excision of or debulking is perhaps the most uh, useful or one of the most useful ways of palliative relief in patients with intractable, medically intractable hypercalcemia. Even R1 resections help, even if you are not able to achieve a complete clearance, yet uh, uh, debulking is helpful in palliating. In patients who come back with recurrence, complete cure may be unlikely. So patients who have symptomatic or significant hypercalcemia need to be treated for hypercalcemia medically or surgically, repeated resections may be required and metastatectomy uh, may be resorted to. Adjuvant therapy can be tried in non-resectable disease. So this is an example of the very old, the very same old, old uh, one of the first parathyroid carcinomas in our own experience, who has had three reoperations for this disease. And uh, this, this was the picture of second reoperation in 2007, where uh, end block excision of mass with ipsilateral uh, central nerve dissection was done. But of course, the patient has had two further surgeries, including a tracheal resection, which was reported recently by my colleagues in uh, Indian General Surgical Oncology. Uh, there are anecdotal reports of variable response to cytotoxic chemotherapy but it is definitely not the standard of care. Uh, Anti-PTH immunotherapy has been tried, so has been octotide and azidothymidine. These are all experimental therapies. In fact, currently there are three clinical trials listed on clinicaltrials.gov, and uh, these include these immunotherapies as, and lutetium dotonate, dot, 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 dotonate therapy as well. Radiotherapy, is not very useful because these tumors have traditionally been considered radio resistant in last one decade or perhaps more about two decades in the last two decades there have been some reports anecdotally which have reported lower local recurrence rates following adjuvant rt but these are retrospective studies with very few patients uh, so currently radiotherapy is not rec routinely recommended post-operatively but may be considered for patients who have locally invasive or aggressive cancers and also for recurrent metastatic non resectable disease. Management of hypercalcemia is what needs to be very uh, aggressively done in patients who have symptomatic or significant biochemical hypercalcemia. Uh, this may be just as you would do for any patient with parathyroid, hyperparathyroid, hypercalcemic crisis, uh, aggressive hydration with saline, loop diuretics, bisphosphonates, uh, calcium mimetics, et cetera. Other modalities which have been tried in recurrent and unresectable uh, parathyroid carcinomas include ethanol injection, radiofrequency ablation, and PTH peptide immunotherapy, which, which has been shown to have a transient benefit and a clinical trial is continuing. How do you follow these patients? These patients need lifelong follow-up. <sighs> you have a good tumor marker in form of calcium and PTH, but 
patients with poorly differentiated or de-differentiated parathyroid carcinoma, serum CEA can be of some use. Uh, recurrence uh, is uh, quite common in patients in these, uh, in, in, with, with parathyroid carcinoma, and the mean time to recurrence has been reported at three years. Uh, according to the National Cancer Database, the 10-year survival uh, was reported at 49%. This has slightly improved. MD Anderson experience has been that the 10-year survival is 77%. The SEER database 10-year survival reported was 68%. And in a meta-analysis uh, reported in 2010, the five-year survival uh, was reported between 45 and 85% and 10-year between 35 and 79%. The cause of death usually is refractory hypercalcemia and its complications and not the tumor invasion or uh, tumor per se. These are the predictors of poor prognosis, male gender, young age, high serum calcium, non-functional tumor, vascular invasion, lymph nodal metastasis, failure to perform uh, R0 resection at the first time, multiple uh, reoperations or multiple recurrences, whereas presence of fibrous bands seems to be indicative of good prognosis. In our own experience over the last three decades, we have managed 17 patients until the end of last year, which constituted about 4% of all patients of PHPT we have treated. Uh, the mean age in these patients was 45 years. In fact, this mean age is higher as compared to mean age of all PHPT patients we have treated. And that's quite startlingly different than the Western uh, experiences. The pre and intraoperative suspicion for parathyroid carcinoma was entertained in 11 further, at least, they, it may have been entertained even more because this is something which is not always recorded in the operating notes, but in at least 11 more patients uh, who did not eventually turn out to be uh, parathyroid carcinoma, uh, intraoperative or preoperative suspicion of carcinoma was entertained. Eight of these turned out to be atypical adenomas and three turned out to be classical adenomas. So uh, this is an example of a patient where we had a false alarm. You can see this is the parathyroid tumor. Uh, this was a lower gland, quite a large one. Invading the thyroid lobe, we, the, this is the thyroid lobe. We, we were wondering if this too is an extension of the thyroid, parathyroid carcinoma. There was no plane here which could be developed. So eventually we did the right thing in doing an end block resection of this tumor along with the thyroid lobe. Uh, there were no metastatic nodes, so we did not do a central compartment dissection. But this kind of false alarm we have had rather too frequently. But I feel still doing an end block resection at that time is not a very high price to pay to achieve cure. The proportion of patients uh, with parathyroid carcinoma in our experience has been coming down, but it seems to have plateaued now. And Sanjay, one of our recent uh, MCH pass outs, uh, he, as part of his research, MCH research project, he published this in recent uh, issues of virginal surgery, where you can see in the initial cohort between 1990 to 1999, the proportion of patients with parathyroid carcinoma was 11.6%. In the second cohort, in the uh, the decade of 2000 to 2009, it came down to 3.57%. In the third cohort, that is 2010 to 2016, the proportion was 3.2% only. And this, this definitely shows a reducing trend. And perhaps it has to, more to do with higher number of patients with PHPT being diagnosed and not necessarily uh, uh, under diagnosis of parathyroid carcinoma. And this is a, a table listing the outcomes of some of our parathyroid carcinoma patients uh, based on an analysis done in 2009. Uh, there, were, uh, there were nine patients all in all, and we are aware that at least five of them have died and the rest have, uh, four of them have died. Uh, one of them perioperatively at, uh, at, at two weeks, another died two months following surgery but the rest have died of metastatic disease. So in the end, the take home message as far as parathyroid carcinoma is concerned for my, my uh, residents and young colleagues, it is a rare malignancy. It is a rare cause of primary hyperparathyroidism and a high index of suspicion is needed by the treating doctors, both while evaluating and while surgery uh, for PHPT to diagnose or detect hyperparathyroidism caused by parathyroid carcinoma. Uh, but unfortunately, 
the diagnosis is often missed or delayed, mostly diagnosed post-operatively. Uh, the treatment, only worthwhile treatment is radical surgery at the first time, uh, which requires early identification, pre or intraoperatively, complete resection without tumor spillage, uh, along with excision of any of the invaded structures, offers the best chance of cure. And there is no proven adjuvant treatment. Local and distant recurrences are common, and usually the patients die because of refractory hypercalcemia and not due to the cancer itself. These patients, after surgery, they need lifelong follow-up, as I have described. So uh, that is what I had to talk about parathyroid carcinoma.